This is a fantasy map I've been tinkering with. I think it's neat. I'm especially proud of the coastlines that keep revealing complexity no matter how far you zoom in. You'll see more of that in a bit. There's something wonderful about a good map, especially in a fantasy world. It's no coincidence, I think, all my favorite books when I was growing up had a map or two at the beginning. And in a role-playing game where you can go anywhere, where you can explore, a map can make the world seem so full, so big, so real. I've made a lot of maps for my games. Not like this, usually. Most of my maps have been doodled with wet erase markers or maybe MS Paint. But even with such sophisticated tools, and I know you're very impressed, some of the maps really worked. They made the players excited, they got explored, they got remembered. And others didn't so much. This video is about the difference. The thing I've learned you can add to any map for role-playing and make it better. And if you're missing it, you're missing a huge opportunity. First, let me tell you what it's not. It isn't fancy tools and pretty art. Now, nice art helps for sure. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't. I'm a big fan of Incarnate, for example, because they can make my chicken scratches look half decent. Not a sponsor, I just like them. <laughs> like I get sponsors with my tiny channel. I'll put a link down below anyway. But whether you use tools like that or not, I've got good news for you. Even if you suck at drawing like me, you can make amazing maps. That's not the crucial ingredient. Another thing that doesn't really matter is whether you get the geology right. It doesn't hurt. I sometimes get very technical with my maps, charting out the tectonic plates first. From those, the continents and mountains. From those, the ocean and atmospheric currents. And from those, the deserts and rivers. Put deserts in rain shadows, rivers go downhill, from the mountains to the sea, always merging, never forking, except maybe at the end if there's a delta. With rivers in place, I can lay out my trade routes, my shipping lanes, my cities, my borders, and that's all fun. But it's also not the secret sauce. You can honestly have rivers flowing over the tops of hills. Most people won't notice. So if it isn't the art, and if it isn't the realism, what then? What makes a great map? It's how your players interact with the map. It's the curiosity, the thrill of discovery. RPGs can do something nothing else can do, except real life, I guess. You can look at a place and think, I wonder what it's like there. And then holy bananas, the game lets you actually go and find out. That's the promise and payoff. It's fantastic, and a great map encourages it, delivers on it. And most GMs have some sense of this. They halfway do it, but then they go and make it really hard to do any actual exploring. That's the big mistake. In Dungeons & Dragons, it's tradition to have a random encounter on the way if you want to travel anywhere. And most random encounters include a battle. And battles in D&D are so slow. So the players spend half a session trying to get to the place and then an entire session fighting a displacer beast or whatever. And finally they get to the ancient ruins or whatever thing they wanted to explore and what have they learned? They've learned it takes two weeks of real time. Maybe four if you don't meet every week or there were scheduling problems. There are always scheduling problems just to go somewhere. Four weeks is so long. Half the group can't even remember why they wanted to go there in the first place. And you can bet the next time the group is thinking about going somewhere, oh, they're going to think real hard about whether it's worth a month of real time. They're not going to go anywhere just to check it out, that's for sure. Because the only thing worse than spending all that time to get somewhere is spending all that time and then there's nothing worthwhile when they arrive. DISASTER! Even if that's never happened, even if the GM secretly vows never to let it happen, the players might not be willing to take that risk. So they're going to look to the GM for clues about where the plot is, where they're supposed to go. And that's the opposite of exploration. You might as well not even have a map. And even if the GM assures the players, don't worry about the plot, you can go anywhere. Where would you like to go? Gesturing at the universe. That's a whole different problem. Infinite choice is too much. Players usually don't want to pick a direction at random and strike out for no reason. And if they do, that's probably a sign they're getting bored. We want to explore, but we also want reasons to explore. There needs to be a spark of curiosity, a chance of reward, some suggestion for where we might go and what we might find there. And it really seems like a map should be able to do that for us. So what's to be done? Because all the stuff that bogs down and punishes exploration does serve a purpose. We may want a story of epic journeys and grand far-off places. We may want a sense that the wild is dangerous and travel is too. We may even want to make certain kinds of exploration hard so that the payoff is all the more sweet. How then? P-I-N. Points of interest nearby, or PINs for short, like pins in a map. 
pins are locations relevant enough to mark on a map, but not important enough to label, like those little red dots that appear when you search on Google Maps. Pins say, there's something here. Ask if you want to learn more. Pins can represent anything explorable that might catch the character's attention, from visible landmarks to shops in a town to objects in a room. Pins are not grand destinations. They are curiosities, places you notice as you pass by or visit on the way to somewhere else. Pins are always nearby, points of interest nearby, whatever that means for your game. If the players travel, then the old pins vanish and new ones appear. Perhaps a few pins appear on the way. Most pins should be quick to check out, not a big deal. Pins are invitations to explore, temptations to leave the path, promises that the GM is ready and excited for the players to wander a bit in the world they've crafted. They are visual reminders that you can always stop and look around a little. At any given time, I like to have between 3 and 10 pins that the players can see. The players only get vague information about what each pin is. You hear rushing water and the faint sounds of music from that way. Pin in the map. You see a shop whose sign is glowing with live flaming coals. Pin on the map. A silver cat ran down this alley. Pin. You feel a brief shiver when you glimpse that distant boulder. Pin. Those trees have purple veins. Pin. Is it working? Do you feel the intrigue? Which of those things would you explore? I'm keeping them vague on purpose because it helps spark the curiosity and lets me harness the two secret powers of pins. Power 1. You can make a lot of them. If you frequently add new pins and take old ones away, the players quickly realize they can't explore them all. There are too many, and it creates a sense that the world is vast and full as worlds should be. Power 2. You can put off deciding what the pins actually are. Personally, I like to plan some pins carefully ahead of time, but let most be whatever I need them to be when the players get there. Am I trying to keep the players on a carefully planned plot line? What a coincidence! That pin they picked happens to be a crucial part of the story. Am I trying to show off the world I built? What are the odds this pin happens to showcase some element of the world I'm really proud of? Are the players looking for something specific? How convenient, the next pin they visit has clues about that thing. Or sometimes they get there and it's just an interesting place, not really relevant to them at all. That's part of exploring too, and when the pins don't take up much time, you can afford it. Like all aspects of role-playing, you might use more or less planning and that's fine. The point of the pin is it gives the players the means, the incentive, the permission to explore in a way that doesn't take multiple sessions, and it gives them at least the illusion of real agency. Especially if you're going through the trouble of having a map anyway, you might as well sprinkle it with some pins. And then you might as well check out the board game I made, Minions and Madness. Oh yeah, nailed that transition. It's a 1-5 to five player strategy board game with a little dark humor where you're the bad guy. Build an evil lair, vanquish the meddling heroes, stack your minions into a pyramid scheme so they have to pay you when they come to work. I'm very proud of the semi-cooperative play style. You have to work together with the other evil geniuses at least a little or the heroes will crush you. The power of friendship is... it's rough. But also, you've got to get the better end of every deal, or you'll just hand the world to some other evil genius, and how embarrassing would that be? I want to make a Kickstarter once there's enough interest, so please check out the link below if this looks fun to you. And until next time, toodles.